Hello everyone, my name is AJ Keefe, and in this video I'll be reviewing the concepts of neuronal metabolism and NADH production and how, this, how these concepts relate to this paper titled Neuronal Stimulation Triggers Neuronal Glycolysis and Not Lactate Uptake, published in the Journal of Cell Metabolism. I want to thank the authors for their contribution to this field of research. And for this video, I recommend that my viewers pause the, the video at each new slide and read through the material uh, before playing my commentary. And if you have any questions, uh, please comment below and thanks for watching. So I'm hoping that we're all familiar with a neur neuronal action potential and stimulation by excitatory amino acid or neurotransmitter glutamate. When a postsynaptic cell releases glutamate, it primarily binds two different receptors, either ionotropic or metabotropic receptors. Metabotropic receptors are actually primarily located on astrocytes, which are like neuronal helper cells that use their end feet to kind of envelop a synapse to form what's ca called a, a tripartite synapse. When a postsynaptic neuron releases glutamate, it stimulates not just the postsynaptic neuron, but also the associated astrocyte through these metabotropic glutamate receptors. This activates the astrocyte, and some believe, uh, some believe that these metabotropic glutamate receptor uh, activation on, on astrocytes leads to the release of lactate. And we'll discuss the importance of uh, astrocytic lactate release in a second. The other uh, glutamatergic receptor, ionotropic um, glutamate receptors, are primarily located on neurons. And the binding of glutamate induces the opening of their channel. And this allows selective uh, perme permeabilization of calcium ions. So ionotropic glutamate receptors uh, bind glutamate and they allow calcium to rush into the cell. And this is the primary mechanism by which an excitatory action potential uh, excites the postsynaptic neuron. So postsynaptic neuron activation vastly upregulates ATP usage and production. This primarily occurs because mounting an action potential and propagating one is a very energetically expensive process because it involves tons of ion transporters like the, the sodium potassium pumps, uh, which actually account for 70% of the brain's total ATP use. So in order to get this tremendous amount of ATP, uh, it needed to shuttle ions across its membrane, uh, the cell begins importing and burning glucose. So re remember that glucose, when it's imported, is oxidized into CO2, and its high energy electrons end up on NADH. This occurs first in the cyto uh, cytoplasm through glycolysis, which produces a little bit of ATP and a little bit of NADH and results in the production of pyruvate. And cytoplasm cytoplasmic pyruvate is then transported into the mitochondria where the famous uh, citric acid cycle essentially tears, uh, tears the pyruvate into its component electrons and CO2. The electrons of, of glucose, again, they end up on NADH for the most part and excess carbon in the form of CO2 is a waste product that is simply released and allowed to diffuse out of the cell. CO2 production acidifies the microenvironment and activates regional vasodilation, which then increases blood flow and increases oxygen. Since CO2 is a gas that doesn't diffuse very well in blood, it gets converted into bicarbonate by carbo uh, carbonic anhydrase, and this reaction produces a proton, meaning it acidifies the blood. So CO2 from neurons burning glucose produces protons that acidifies the microenvironment, and this activates smooth, mu uh, smooth muscle cells to dilate blood vessels. Vasodilation will then um, increase the oxygen flux to sustain ATP generation through oxidative phosphorylation, or OxFos. So remember that all those high energy electrons that were stripped off of glucose well, they have to go somewhere eventually, and you don't want those electrons flying off and landing wherever they want. So the cell actually directs those electrons onto oxygen because oxygen loves electrons. It's very electronegative. And this is the 
actually the process of oxidative phosphorylation, where electrons from glucose are used to pump protons in the mitochondria, and eventually the electrons land onto oxygen. And the, the purpose of pumping electrons is to power ATP synthase, which uh, is essentially a, a turbine that crunches ADP and inorganic phosphate to produce ATP. For the purposes of this paper, however, we need to focus on NADH. So again, NADH is the critical electron carrier, and without NADH, electrons would just fly off, and they would land onto random proteins, and the process of glucose oxidation would just be completely uncontrolled. So by coupling glucose oxidation in glycolysis and the citric acid cycle to NAD, it allows those high energy electrons to be carried by NADH. And once NAD uh, picks up an electron, it becomes NADH after, you know, after reduction, because it carries the, the hydrogen with it, because it, if you're gonna have a negative charge or a positive charge that comes with it, and that's the, the hydrogen. So uh, reduction of NAD creates, creates NADH in the citric acid cycle and glycolysis. And NADH provides the reduction potential for oxidative phosphorylation or oxphos. So it provides the negatively charged high energy electrons for oxphos. So oxphos, which is where ATP is primarily produced, requires most importantly NADH because that's where it gets the electrons needed to pump protons and power ATP synthesis. Oxphos or NADH is what's used to create the proton uh, um, concentration gradient that can power ATP synthase. And NADH is hugely important. And so just for simplicity, just think of it as a carrier of energy in the form of reduction potential or the ability to donate electrons. So the big question is where do neurons get their electrons from? Do they get it? Do they get these high energy electrons directly from glucose imported themselves or are astrocytes helping them by producing lactate? We'll, we'll discuss in a second how lactate can be used to get uh, high energy electrons. There are three main sources of cytoplasmic NADH for a neuron. I need to make a quick note that this paper focuses on cytoplasmic NADH. And to be honest, I'm not completely sure why they're focused on cytoplasmic NADH production because the majority of NADH is produced in the mitochondria during the citric acid cycle. And I think, as it, I think it's because NADH production is saturated in the mitochondria, they mentioned that. And so I, I suppose the authors are curious how NADH production continues even when the citric acid cycle enzymes are saturated. And so how does NADH continue to be produced when the citric acid cycle is running at max, uh, maximum capacity? Anyways, uh, cytoplasmic NADH can potentially come from a molecule of lactate, which you might remember is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism or oxygen-free metabolism. So lactate can be converted into pyruvate, the end product of glycolysis and NADH by this enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. So lactate can be a source of electrons. And after the conversion of pyruvate and NADH, it, this pyruvate can be further shuttled into the conventional citric acid cycle and, and made in, in, into, and it can be completely oxidized. So this lactate dehydrogenase enzyme, which we're gonna see in this paper, can take lactate from wherever uh, a neuron finds lactate from, like maybe perhaps an astrocyte, and it can turn that lactate into pyruvate and NADH. NADH being the electron. Another more intuitive, uh, intuitive pathway is simply glycolysis, as we discussed earlier. So glucose can be imported into the, the neuron and shuttled through glycolysis to produce two NADH per unit of glucose. And a third source of NADH in the cytoplasm can come from the mitochondria themselves, obviously. But in the context of neuronal activation, that doesn't make much sense because NADH is need, needed in the mitochondria, so it wouldn't make sense for it to be transported into the cytoplasm. So one theory that has largely dominated the field of neuronal metabolism 
is the astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle idea. This theory posits that astrocytes following activation by metabotropic glutamate receptors releases lactate into the extracellular matrix. And this lactate is then imported into neurons through a transporter called MCT. So lactate is taken up by neurons by MCT and then it's converted into pyruvate through the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme to produce a molecule of NADH. So this theory is supported by evidence that astrocytes are more glycolytic. And since um, glycolysis produces lactate, if, it's, if there is not enough oxygen around, uh, it's, it's possible that increased glycolytically active uh, astrocytes are just producing more lactate than they need. And since they don't have all these as many ion pumps to power, they just give this excess lactate to neurons to give neurons their, their NADH. Um, astrocytes also have less energy demand than neurons, and indeed they've actually been observed uh, releasing lactate that is subsequently picked up by neurons and used. So this process does happen. There is lactate that's released and it is picked up by neurons. But the big question is, does this actually happen during neural stimulation and is it a critical process? Like, does this need to happen? One big problem with this process is that it might be too slow on the time scale of neuronal activation to supply neurons with ATP. Another theory suggests a more simple explanation. So following neuronal stimulation, neurons import more glucose than normal through, and, and, and through glycolysis, they produce two NADH per glucose, which is twice as much NADH than lactate, I should add. And, and this does not rely on waiting for astrocytes to release lactate. So this idea is appealing because first of all, it's more simple and it can happen more quickly on the time scale of an action potential. And there's no reason to believe it can't happen this way. Why should a neuron be reliant on astrocytes for lactate and NADH production when a neuron can potentially do all of that itself? Of course, of course a neuron already is known to import glucose and oxidize it through glycolysis. So maybe this process is simply upregulated during increased energy demand. So which is it? Does lactate or glucose provide this backup uh, cytoplasmic NADH production that occurs during an action potential and during citric acid cycle saturation? So glutamate stimulated neurons require increased ATP and to meet this demand, they upregulate NADH production to power more oxidative phosphorylation and ATP synthase. And since mitochondrial pyruvate oxidation, also known as cit the citric acid cycle, saturates fairly rapidly during neuronal activation, the authors are curious how additional NADH in the cytoplasm is, is continued to be produced. So how do neurons get their NADH? Well, it can come from three sources. Again, NADH can come from either lactate potentially dried from astrocytes, uh, glucose from simple glycolysis, or from mitochondrial uh, citric acid cycle. So in the current study, the researchers sought to finally discover exactly what's going on and where a neuron gets its uh, NADH from. So they began by extracting slices of mouse hippocampal brain uh, sections and essentially they cultured these, these slices and then they observed them in action. In order to see NADH and action potentials, they used two uh, special fluorophores, one that is activated by NADH and one that is activated by calcium. And when these neuronal slices were stimulated with, gluco or with um, um, uh, glutamate, sorry, when they were stimulated with glutamate, they saw upregulation of NADH. So this is the so-called NADH, NADH transient as expected. And interestingly, when they inhibited action potentials by inhibiting uh, neuronal ionotropic glutamate receptors, but not astrocytic metabotropic receptors, they saw no NADH transient. In other words, NADH transients require neuronal activation and not astrocytic activation. Uh, furthermore, the nail in the coffin came from these 
these experiments looking at the effect of inhibiting lactate import, which did not affect NADH transients. So inhibiting the MCT lactate transporter or lactate dehydrogenase, these two events had no effect on NADH transients. Instead, they observed that increased neuronal glycolysis and glucose utilization was fueling the NADH transients. The, uh, these results collectively suggest that stimulated neurons do not utilize lactate. Instead, they simply upregulate glucose import and glycolysis to meet, uh, increase ATP and NADH demand. Okay, so let's get into the, the specifics. The first uh, challenge to addressing these questions is how do you actually see NADH and calcium flux in live animals? So to make NADH and calcium essentially visible through a microscope, they genetically engineered mice to express the biosensor called Paradox. Peridox. So Paradox is a fluorophore that emits fluorescence upon binding to NADH. Then they have this other fluorophore that's also expressed called R-CAMP. And R-CAMP is a fluorophore that emits fluorescence upon binding calcium. And so when NADH or calcium concentrations rise, these endogenously expressed proteins will bind to them and emit fluorescence so they can be detected with a microscope. They took some mouse uh, hippocampi sections that are still alive, and they watched how they respond to glutamate. When glutamate was added, we see that there's a both a calcium and a NADH spike as quantified with these biosensors. So this, this graph, for example, is pretty straightforward. So they're saying at the time of glutamate uh, addition to, this, to the slices, we see there, there's an increase in the calcium concentrations. And about a minute or two after, there's a rise in the NADH concentrations. So there's a, a, there's a lag of about one minute after adding the, the glutamate before we see the NADH transient. Next, the researchers wondered if blocking action potentials in the neurons, but not astrocyte activation, would affect NADH transients. So the, the idea here is that if lactate derived from activated astrocytes is fueling NADH transients, then blocking neuronal activation, but not astrocyte activation, should allow the NADH transients to persist. But they didn't see this. When they block the activation, or sorry, when they blocked action potentials, uh, there was no NADH transient. So even though um, astrocytes are activated right here, we're seeing activation of astrocytes, but not neurons, we do not see an NADH transient. So there's lactate being spewed into the extracellular space. There's plenty of lactate around, but there is no NADH transient. Well, if lactate isn't needed for the NADH transient, then what is? So on the right here, we see the effect of both lactate supplementation and inhibition of glycolysis with this molecule called IAA. So they're inhibiting glycolysis right here. And we see that lactate presence right through here didn't really have any effect at all on the NADH transient. But inhibiting glycolysis with IAA significantly reduced the subsequent um, NADH transient following stimulation. And in order to perform this experiment, they had, they had to cool the neuronal slices because inhib uh, the inhibition of glycolysis resulted in a, a very rapid decline in glucose levels. So the idea here is that uh, performing, perf uh, performing this experiment after inhibition of glycolysis and inhibiting all those enzymes, and uh, I think this is a suicide inhibitor, so these enzymes are permanently inhibited, when they brought these cells back to normal temperature, we see the NADH transient was vastly reduced. And this is because glycolytic enzymes are inhibited right here. In these bottom panels, they observed that inhibition of glucose import with this other molecule called uh, Cyto-B or cyto b significantly increased the decline of glucose following stimulation. So they're using another glucose sensitive biosensor called Sweetie TS. And when net glucose import um, 
was stopped, they saw glucose concentrations dip. So in other words, glucose is being burned very quickly during neuronal transients. And if you block the import of, of glucose import, we see these dips increase because there's glucose that's being used during these action potentials. So in other words, glucose is being burned up very quickly during these neuronal transients. And this suggests that glucose is being utilized uh, to produce NADH and, and not lactate. To carry these findings to the live animal, they observed calcium and NADH transients in awake functioning mice using, um, they did this by opening their cranium and imaging their barrel cortex with a two photon microscope uh, following whisker flicks. So they're flicking their whiskers, which causes a very uh, predictable pattern of activation in the barrel cortex. And they observed uh, both calcium and NADH transients that were not responding to uh, uh, lacto uh, lactate import inhibition by this ARC155858. So they're inhibiting lactate import in the live animal. They're not seeing any decrease in the paradox signal. And this is just uh, control conditions. So the summary here that uh, we, we, what we've seen in this paper is that neuronal stimulation produces a burst in NADH production and this uh, fuels oxidative phosphorylation. This NADH transient occurs even when the lactate transporter, MCT, is inhibited. And when the lactate digesting enzyme, lactate dehydrogenase, is inhibited as well. Inhibition of a neuron's postsynaptic ionotropic glutamate receptor uh, is able to successfully block NADH transients despite astrocytic activation of metabotropic glutamate receptors. NADH transients occur alongside increased glucose utilization and inhibition of glucose import uh, significantly stunts NADH transients, arguing for the role of increased glycolysis in producing the NADH transients. And this is the general pathway that is being put forth. You have glutamate stimulation of the neuron. This causes glucose to be imported uh, and burned in glycolysis, which produces NADH, uh, so it can be used for oxidative phosphorylation and production of ATP using ATP synthase. So I hope you guys enjoyed this paper, and I want to thank the authors again for this. Uh, I really, I really enjoyed this paper. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please, please comment them, and I'll promptly respond. And thanks for watching.